Enter the chilly no man's land of precisely five o'clock in the morning. The no color void where the waking head rubbishes out the draggled lot of sulfurous dreamscapes and obscure lunar conundrums which seemed, when dreamed, to mean so profoundly much. Gets ready to face the ready made creation of chairs and bureaus and sleep twisted sheets. This is the kingdom of the fading apparition. The oracular ghost who dwindles on pin legs to a knot of laundry, with a classic bunch of sheets upraised as a hand emblematic of farewell. At this joint between two worlds and two entirely incompatible modes of time, the raw material of our meat and potato thoughts assumes the nimbus of ambrosial revelation and so departs. But his chair and bureau are the hieroglyphs of some godly utterance wakened heads ignore. So these posed sheets, before they thin to nothing, speak in sign language of a lost other world, a world we lose by merely waking up into sanity. The common ghosts crowed out, worms riddling its tongue, or walks for Hamlet all day on the printed page or bodies itself for dowagers in drafty castles at twelve, or inhabits the crystal of the sick man's eye, trailing its tell-tale tatters only at the outermost fringe of mundane vision. But this ghost goes hand aloft, goodbye, goodbye, not down into the rocky gizzard of the earth, but toward the region where our thick atmosphere diminishes, and God knows what is there. A point of exclamation marks that sky in ringing orange like a stellar carrot. Its round period, displaced and green, suspends beside it the first point, the starting point of Eden, next the new moon's curve. Go, ghost of our mother and father, ghost of us and ghost of our dreams' children, in those sheets which signify our origin and end to the cloud cuckoo land of color wheels and pristine alphabets and cows that moo and moo as they jump over moons as new as that crisp cusp toward which you voyage now. Hail and farewell, hello, goodbye, O keeper of the profane grail, the dreaming skull. The scene stands stubborn, Skin flint trees hoard last leaves, won't mourn, wear sackcloth, or turn to elegiac dryads, and dour grass guards the hard-hearted emerald of its grassiness, however the grandiloquent mind may scorn such poverty. So no dead men's voices, flower forget-me-nots between the stone paving this grave ground. Here's honest rot to unpick the elaborate heart, pear bone free of the fictive vein. When one stark skeleton bulks real, all saints' tongues fall quiet. Flies watch no resurrections in the sun. At the essential landscape, stare, stare till your eyes foist a vision dazzling on the wind. Whatever lost ghosts flare, damned, howling in their shrouds across the moor, rave on the leash of the starving mind, which peoples the bare room, the blank, untenanted air. Hearing a white saint rave about a quintessential beauty visible only to the paragon heart, I tried my sight on an apple tree that for eccentric knob and wart had all my love. Without meat or drink, I sat, starving my fantasy down, to discover that metaphysical tree which hid from my worldling look its brilliant vein far deeper in gross wood than axe could cut. But before I might blind sense to see with the spotless soul, each particular quirk so ravished me, every pock and stain bulked more beautiful than flesh of any body flawed by love's prints. Battle however I would, to break through that patchwork of leaves bicker and whisk in babble tongues, streak and mottle of torn bark, no visionary lightnings pierced my dense lid. Instead, a wanton fit dragged each dazzled sense apart, 
Swiffeting eye, ear, taste, touch, smell, now, snared by this miraculous art, I ride earth's burning carousel, day in, day out, and such grit corrupts my eyes, I must watch sluttish dryads twitch their multifarious silks in the holy grove, until no chaste tree but suffers blotch under flux of those seductive reds, greens, blues. They are always with us, the thin people, meager of dimension as the grey people on a movie screen. They are unreal, we say. It was only in a movie, it was only in a war, making evil headlines when we were small, that they famished and grew so lean, and would not round out their stocky limbs again, though peace plumped the bellies of the mice under the meanest table. It was during the long hunger battle they found their talent to persevere in thinness, to come later into our bad dreams. Their menace, not guns, not abuses, but a thin silence. Wrapped in flea-ridden donkey skins or bits of burlap, squatting together on granite steps where the mica glinted at noonday like broken glass, famous for their scantness, empty of complaint, forever drinking vinegar from tin cups. They wore the insufferable nimbus of the lot-drawn scapegoat, but so thin, so weedy a race could not remain in dreams, could not remain outlandish victims in the contracted country of the head, any more than the old woman in her mud hut could keep from cutting fat meat out of the side of the generous moon when it set foot nightly in her yard, until her knife had paired the moon to a rind of little light. Now the thin people do not obliterate themselves as the dawn grayness blues, reddens, and the outline of the world comes clear and fills with color. They persist in a sunlit room. The wallpaper frieze of cabbage roses and cornflowers pales under their thin-lipped smiles, their withering kingship. How they prop each other up, they outnumber us in the towns, in the cities, and we own no wildernesses rich and deep enough for stronghold against their stiff battalions. See how the tree boles flatten and lose their good browns if the thin people simply stand in the forest, making the world go thin as a wasp's nest and grayer, not even moving their bones. Flint-like, her feet struck such a racket of echoes from the steely street, tacking in moon-blued crooks from the black stone-built town, that she heard the quick air ignite its tinder and shake a firework of echoes from wall to wall of the dark dwarfed cottages. But the echoes died at her back as the walls gave way to fields and the incessant seethe of grasses riding in the full of the moon manes to the wind, Tireless, tied as a moon-bound sea moves on its route. Though a mist wraith wound up from the fissured valley and hung shoulder high ahead, it fattened to no family-featured ghost, nor did any word body with a name the blank mood she walked in. Once past the dream-peopled village, her eyes entertained no dream, and the sandman's dust lost luster under her foot soles. The long wind, paring her person down to a pinch of flame, blew its burdened whistle in the hall of her ear, and like a scooped-out pumpkin crown, her head cupped the babble. All the night gave her, in return for the paltry gift of her bulk and the beat of her heart, was the humped indifferent iron of its hills, and its pastures bordered by black stone set on black stone. Barns guarded broods and litters behind shut doors. The dairy herds knelt in the meadow, mute as boulders. Sheep drowsed stonewood in their tussocks of wool, and birds, twig sleeping, wore granite ruffs, their shadows the guise of leaves. The whole landscape loomed absolute as the antique world was, once in its earliest sway of lymph and sap, unaltered by eyes enough to snuff the quick of her small heat out. 
But before the weight of stones and hills of stones could break her down to mere quartz grit in that stony light, she turned back. In sunless air, under pines, green to the point of blackness, some founding father set these lobed, warped stones to loom in the leaf-filtered gloom, black as the charred knuckle bones of a giant or extinct animal, come from another age, another planet, surely. Flanked by the orange and fuchsia bonfire of azaleas, sacrosanct, these stones guard a dark repose, and keep their shapes intact while sun alters shadows of rose and iris, long, short, long, in the lit garden, and kindles a day's end blaze, colored to dull the pigment of the azaleas, yet burnt out quick as they. To follow the light's tint and intensity by midnight, by noon, and through the worst brunt of various weathers is to know the still heart of the stones, Stones that take the whole summer to lose their dream of winter's dead cold. Stones warming at core only as first frost forms the icicle. Such stones keep their own time as God keeps his, no grain spent. Such stones keep all times rolled round their aloof selfhood. I walk round them, they hold still. I think no man's crowbar could uproot them. Their beards are evergreen, nor do they, once in a hundred years, go down to drink the river. No thirst disturbs a stone's bed. Fired in sanguine clay, the model head fit nowhere. Brick dust complected, eye under a dense lid, on the long bookshelf it stood, stolidly propping thick volumes of prose. Spite set ape of her look. Best rid half stone at once of the outrageous head. Still she would not junk it. No place it seemed for the effigy to sit on its pillared neck in peace. Rough boys spying an extra pate, glowering sullen and pompous from an ash heap, might well seize this prize, maltreat the hostage head in shocking ways and rouse the sly nerve up that knits to each original its coarse copy. A dark tarn she thought of then, thick silted with weeds obscured, to serve her exacting turn. But out of the watery aspic, laurelled by fins, the simulacrum leered, lewdly beckoning, and her courage wavered. She blenched as one who drowns, and resolved more ceremoniously to lodge the mimic head in a crotched willow, green vaulted by foliage. Let bell-tongued birds discant in blackest feather on the rendering, grain by grain, of that uncouth shape to simple sod again through drear and dulcet weather. Yet, shrined on her shelf, the grisly visage endured, despite her wrung hands, her tears, her praying, vanish. Steadfast and evil-starred, it ogled through rock fault, wind flaw, and fisted wave. An antique hag head, too tough for knife to finish, refusing to diminish by one jot its basilisk look of love. Ravening through the persistent bric-a-brac of blunt pencils, rose-sprigged coffee cup, postage stamps, stacked books, clamor and yop, neighborhood cockcrow, all nature's prodigal backtalk. The vaunting mind snubs impromptu spiels of wind and wrestles to impose its own order on what is. With my fantasy alone, brags the importunate head, arrogant among rook-tongued spaces, sheep greens, finned falls. I shall compose a crisis to stun sky black out, drive gibbering mad, trout, cock, ram, that bulk so calm on my jealous stare, self-sufficient as they are. But no hocus-pocus of green angels damasks with dazzle the threadbare eye. My trouble, doctor, is I see a tree and that damn scrupulous tree won't practice wiles to beguile sight, 
e.g. by cant of light concocted Daphne, my tree stays tree. However I wrench obstinate bark and trunk to my sweet will, no luminous shape steps out radiant in limb, eye, lip, to hoodwink the honest earth, which point-blank spurns such fiction as nymphs. Cold vision will have no counterfeit palmed off on it. No doubt now in dream-propertied fall, some moon-eyed, star-lucky sleight-of-hand man watches my jilting lady squander coin, gold leaf stock ditches, and the opulent air goes studded with seed, while this beggared brain hatches no fortune, but from leaf, from grass, thieves what it has. No lame excuses can gloss over barge tar clotted at the tide line, the wrecked pier. I should have known better. Fifteen years between me and the bay profited memory, but did away with the old scenery, and patched this shoddy makeshift of a view to quit my promise of an idyll. The blues worn out. It's a niggard estate, inimical now. The great green rock we gave good use as ship and house is black with tarry muck and periwinkles shrunk to common size the cries of scavenging gulls sound thin in the traffic of planes from logan airport opposite gulls circle gray under shadow of a steely flight loss cancels profit except you do this tawdry harbor service and ignore it i go a liar gilding what's i saw we must take loophole and blame time for the rock's dwarfed lump, for the drabbled scum, for a churlish welcome. My father kept a vaulted conch by two bronze bookends of ships in sail, and as I listened its cold teeth seethed with voices of that ambiguous sea old Birkeland missed, who held a shell to hear the sea he could not hear. What the seashell spoke to his inner ear, he knew, but no peasants know. My father died, and when he died, he willed his books and shell away. The books burned up, sea took the shell. But I, I keep the voices he set in my ear, and in my eye the sight of those blue unseen waves for which the ghost of Birkeland grieves. The peasants feast and multiply. Eclipsing the spitted ox, I see neither brazen swan nor burning star, heraldry of a starker age, but three men entering the yard and those men coming up the stair. Profitless, their gossiping images invade the cloistral eye like pages from a gross comic strip. And toward the happening of this happening, the earth turns now. In half an hour, I shall go down the shabby stair and meet coming up those three, worth less than present, past, this future, worthless such vision to eyes gone dull, that once descried Troy's towers fall, saw evil break out of the north. Arena dust rusted by four bulls' blood to a dull redness, the afternoon at a bad end under the crowd's truculence. The ritual death each time botched among dropped capes, ill-judged stabs. The strongest will seemed a will toward ceremony. Obese, dark-faced in his rich yellows, tassels, pom-poms, braids. The picador rode out against the fifth bull to brace his pike and slowly bear down deep into the bent bull neck. Cumbrous routine, not artwork. Instinct for art began with the bull's horn lofting in the mob's hush a lumped man-shape, the whole act formal, fluent as a dance. Blood faultlessly broached, redeemed the solid air, the earth's grossness. It is a chilly god, a god of shades, rises to the glass from his black fathoms, at the window, those unborn, those undone, assemble with the frail paleness of moths, an envious phosphorescence in their wings. Vermilions, bronzes, colors of the sun in the coal fire will not wholly console them. Imagine their deep hunger, deep as the dark, for the blood heat that would ruddle or reclaim. The glass mouth sucks blood heat from my forefinger, 
The old god dribbles in return his words. The old god too writes aureate poetry in tarnished modes, maundering among the wastes, fair chronicler of every foul declension. Age and ages of prose have uncoiled his talking whirlwind, abated his excessive temper when words like locusts drummed the darkening air and left the cobs to rattle, bitten clean. Skies once wearing a blue divine hauteur ravel above us, mistily descend, thickening with motes to a marriage with the mire. He hymns the rotten queen with saffron hair who has saltier aphrodisiacs than virgin's tears. That body queen of death, her wormy couriers are at his bones. Still he hymns juice of her, hot nectarine. I see him, horny skinned and tough, Construe what flinty pebbles the plough blade upturns as ponderable tokens of her love. He, godly, doddering, spells no succinct Gabriel from the letters here, but floridly his amorous nostalgias. Nightfall, cold eye, neither disheartens these goatish tragedians who hawk misfortune like figs and chickens and plaintive against each day decry nature's partial haphazard thumb under white wall and moorish window grief's honest grimace debased by time caricatures itself and thrives extorting pity's coin at random a beggar stops among eggs and loaves Props a leg stump upon a crutch, jiggles his tin cup at the good wives. By lack and loss, these beggars encroach on spirits tenderer than theirs, suffering toughened beyond the fetch of finest conscience. Nightfall obscures the bay's sheer extravagant blue, white house and almond grove. The beggars outlast their evilest star, wryly and with a perfidious verve baffle the dark. The pitying eye. To his house the bodiless come to barter endlessly vision, wisdom, for bodies palpable as his and weighty. Hands moving move priestlier than priests' hands, invoke no vain images of light and air, but sure stations in bronze, wood, stone. Obdurate in dense-grained wood, a bald angel blocks and shapes the flimsy light. Arms folded, watches his cumbrous world eclipse inane worlds of wind and cloud. Bronze dead dominate the floor, resistive, ruddy-bodied, dwarfing us. Our bodies flicker toward extinction in those eyes, which, without him, were beggared of place, time, and their bodies. Emulous spirits make discord, try entry, enter nightmares, until his chisel bequeaths them life livelier than ours, a solider repose than death's.